This evening we're going to be looking, as I said, at a very familiar passage in Scripture, one that um, I think we do well to read often because it does remind us of um, how we ought to be pursuing the Christian life in using, a, um, interestingly enough, an image that's still with us today. Paul probably had in mind here the, um, the idea of uh, the athletic competitions that, that may have been at the root of uh, the Olympics. We still have Olympics. We certainly still have athletic competition. Uh, many of us here maybe have been involved in athletic competition. We know the level of commitment and discipline it requires to be a competitor. But that's exactly the level that the Apostle Paul tells us that we should be committing ourselves to in pursuing the things of the kingdom of heaven. Let me begin by reading 1 Corinthians 9, beginning in verse 19 uh, through verse 27. And uh, we're going to be focusing mainly on verses 24 through 27. Paul writes this, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we and imperishable. Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline myself, or I discipline my body, and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. You know, Paul says a couple of things here that are somewhat troubling, perhaps especially because we're used to hearing about grace all the time and how Jesus Christ has done it all, but we have the idea here in verse 23, I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Now, wasn't Paul a partaker of the gospel already? And then he says, I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified, condemned, cast away. Jesus did say we have to persevere to the end if we're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But you see, those are the marks of a true believer. They will put this kind of effort into serving the Lord. Uh, they will persevere to the end. They will make it by the grace of Christ. And I'm only saying that to point out that it's, sometimes again we think of it as a done deal. There's nothing I have to do. I just believe. I just trust in the grace of Christ toward me and his love towards me. And, and I don't do anything else because the Lord has done it all. And then when I feel like doing something, I do something for his glory. But the Lord tells us his spirit working in us will give to us a zeal for his glory that will cause us to put this kind of effort into serving the Lord. At least we'll be moving in that direction. Now, what I want us to consider this evening is there are things that, that, that undercut that. There's things that short-circuit that, that make it difficult, that weaken us so that we can. And it's because... We're not actually following what it is the Apostle Paul tells us we need to be doing. We're weakening ourselves instead of strengthening ourselves that we might serve the Lord. So I do want to focus on that aspect of it this evening, not the disqualification part. I just wanted to say that up front to give some bite to what it is we're looking at because we do need to understand that the Lord calls us to put effort into living the Christian life. Now, again, I say that because we were reminded this morning of the purpose that we do have as a church, as Christians, which, of course, is to bring glory to Christ. That's why we exist. That's why he saved us. But the primary way he wants us to do that is by bringing his sheep into his fold, or as we saw 
through another analogy this morning, to be fishers of men. Our Lord Jesus, even though He's in heaven, is still gathering uh, people together. He's still bringing His sheep, as it were, through the gospel into His kingdom. But the way He communicates and the way He brings people to Himself today is through us. This work of evangelism is really our responsibility. But the question we ended with this morning was basically this, how can we do it? How can we gather these people in? Well, the answer we looked at this morning just briefly was this, where there's a will, there is a way. But there has to be a will, you see. There has to be a want to. We have to desire it, and we have to desire it strongly enough actually to do it, or we're not going to be very effective in the things that we attempt. Now again, I would go so far as to say that this really is our main purpose in life, to do this. And to the degree that, that our hearts get divided between serving the Lord and other things, to that degree, we are going to be weakened. Now again, it sounds like a very bold statement, but I, I would remind you, we've heard it before many times. And from people that we respect, such as Spurgeon. It wasn't that long ago we were in his book, The Soul Winner. Let me read to you a quote uh, from Spurgeon's Soul Winner. He says this, It is a grand thing to see a man thoroughly possessed with one master passion. Such a man is sure to be strong. And if the master principle be excellent, he is sure to be excellent too. The man of one object is a man indeed. Lives with many aims are like water trickling through innumerable streams, none of which are wide enough or deep enough to float the merest cockle shell of a boat. But a life with one object is like a mighty river flowing between its banks, bearing to the ocean a multitude of ships and spreading fertility on either side. Give me a man not only with a great object in his soul, but thoroughly possessed by it, his powers all concentrated, and himself on fire with vehement zeal for his supreme object. And you have put before me one of the greatest sources of power which the world can produce. Give me a man engrossed with holy love as to his heart, and filled with some masterly celestial thought as to his brain, and such a man will be known wherever his lot may be cast. And I venture to prophesy that his name will be remembered long after the place of his sepulcher shall be forgotten. Now, I would ask you, is that true or isn't that true? Now, last week we, we saw that our great example, the Lord Jesus Christ, was possessed of such a spirit. As a matter of fact, we saw that in our meditation this evening. When his disciples brought him something to eat, he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Fulfilling the purpose for which his father sent him into the world was more important to him than taking care of his hunger, which is often more important to us. He lived with a single purpose, to give glory to his father. Now you know as well as I, the apostle Paul did exactly the same thing. We know that he persecuted the church before Christ saved him and he was throwing his whole life into doing that. But once the Lord saved him, he threw all of his efforts now into preaching the kingdom of heaven and building it up and with the same kind of zeal he tried before to tear it down. Paul says he set aside everything that he had done before. He began to pursue the Lord with his whole heart and he encouraged those that he ministered to, to do exactly the same thing. We have a bit of his personal testimony in Philippians 3, verses 7 through 15. He says, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, 
being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. I want you to notice again, Paul says, this is something I must do in order to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Well, again, we ask ourselves the question, isn't that already a done deal? Didn't Paul already know that that was what was going to happen? Well, Paul didn't trust his own heart. His trust was in Christ. But he knew as long as he followed Christ and as long as he pursued this goal, Jesus was going to be faithful to see him to the end. And he knew that he would do that because he was one of Christ. But this evidence, this outworking of the Spirit of God in his life had to be there. And he pointed this again to the Philippians and he says, that is what your attitude should be as well, to pursue the things above. Now there is an old saying, it goes like this, if you aim at nothing, you're sure to hit it. Basically, if you're not aiming at what Jesus calls you to do, you are sure not to accomplish it. You must pursue his kingdom. You must pursue his work. You must pursue his will with this kind of zeal. With all your heart and with all your soul if you would hope to succeed. Now this evening, Paul reveals a bit more of how he pursued this goal, the kind of discipline that he had, the kind of effort he put into it. This focus, this purpose, this drive that he had that he would compare to an athlete. Now what I'd like us to do is look at three things and that is in order to, to do what the Lord calls us to do, in order to uh, fulfill his will, in order to bring souls home to him, there's three things that you need to do. You must first of all set your eyes on the prize that God has promised because there is a prize, there is a reward. Secondly, you must discipline yourself to seek that prize. And then thirdly, you must put your full effort into winning that prize. Now, first of all, you need to set your eyes on the prize that God promises. Paul pointed to, again, the secular world and talked about you know, the athletes and, and the things that they're after. In verse 25, he says, they then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we, an imperishable. There is a crown, there is a reward, there is a prize for the work that you're doing for the Lord. Now we might ask ourselves, what exactly is that thing? What exactly is that reward that the Lord gives to us? Well, it's been described in many different ways and the Bible says a great deal about it, but let me just give you the way that John Gill summarizes it. In his commentary on Philippians 3.14 where Paul writes, as we've just read, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So what exactly is this prize? Well, put on your thinking caps because Gill is not exactly easy reading. He fills it out very fully. And I'll try to, to read it with, uh, hopefully, in a way that, that will make it un understandable. But uh, do follow along if it's going to be projected on the screen. He writes, the prize is the incorruptible crown, the crown of life, righteousness and glory that fades not away, styled the prize of the calling of God because it is what, what God in the effectual calling calls his people to, even to a kingdom and glory and to eternal glory and happiness of which they have a sight though but a glimmering view of it and are blessed with hope in it in which they rejoice and see their right unto it in the righteousness of Christ and have a suitableness for it. This is named the high calling of God because God is on high who calls them to it 
an allusion to the judge of the Olympic Games who was placed in an exalted situation near the mark with a crown in his hand which he gave to him that came first. And because the grace by which the saints are called is from above, as every good and perfect gift is, and because the prize they are called unto consists of things above where Christ is and is the hope laid up in heaven and the inheritance reserved there and expresses the great honor and dignity of called ones who are called to a crown and kingdom, are raised from the dunghill to sit among princes and to inherit the throne of glory and are made kings and priests unto God. It may also denote the calling to such high honors from above and not below and is owing to the special grace and favor of God and not to any merits of men nor is the prize to which they are called of him that wills and runs, but of God's grace and mercy. Moreover, this calling is said to be in Christ Jesus for both the purpose and grace, according to which men are called, are in him. The grace by which they are called and which is implanted in them when called is all in and from Christ. The blessings of grace which they in person enjoy are spiritual blessings in him, and even the glory they are called unto is in his hands. Not only the promise of eternal life, but that life itself. The gift of it is with him, and it comes through him. Yes, they are called by him and said to be the called of Christ Jesus. Now the prize of this calling, which is what God has prepared from all eternity, which Christ has in his hands and will give to all his and which is of immense richness and eternal duration and shall be bestowed on all Christian runners or true believers is what the apostle was pressing for, pursuing after with much difficulty through great toil and labor, diligent searching of the scriptures, frequent wrestling with God in prayer and constant attendance on the means of grace and ordinances of the gospel. Well, there you go. You see, you've got the whole sermon all wrapped up there. What is this prize? Well, I could read what Gil said again, but I don't want to um, overtax your minds on this. But whatever it is, I mean, what he tells us here is glorious. It is of eternal duration, he says. It lasts forever. It's something you will possess forever. Jonathan Edwards and some of the other Puritans simply summed it up as being immersed in a world of love, as it were, blessed beyond imagination in the presence of God, but also having honor and glory given to you. And the question you see you need to ask is, is this worth it? Is the prize worth it? Is it worth the kind of effort the Lord calls you to put into it? You see, if it isn't worth it to you, then you're really not going to be able to do what it is that Paul calls you to do. Now, of course, the only way it can, you can see it in this way, the only way it can have that kind of value to you is if the, the, the Spirit of God basically opens your eyes to see it. I mean, he not only convinces you that it exists, but he also shows you just how glorious it is. And that's what Jesus meant when he said to Nicodemus, unless you were born again, Unless you're born of the water and of the Spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven, at least in the way you need to see it. You'll never have the desire that you need for that kingdom that will make you willing to give up whatever you have to give up to enter it. So basically, you need to know that there is a prize, a reward that God promises to you, and you have to desire that prize if you're ever going to do what follows. Well, secondly, if you do see the value of that prize, if you actually do want it, you need to discipline yourself to seek after that prize. Paul says in verses 25 and in verses 26 and 27 of our text, for everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Paul says if you are to win this prize, you have to train. 
You have to discipline yourself in the way an athlete would, one who is training for competition. Now, an interesting example of this came to my attention this week. I think many of you here are familiar with Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's kind of become a, a household name in many ways, if for no other reason than he was governor of California from 2003 to 2011 and has been an actor for many years, has shown up in many different movies. Well, before he was governor and before he went into acting, he was an athlete of sorts. He competed in an athletic competition that is called bodybuilding. Now, I recently saw a video where now that Schwarzenegger is years past his competition, now that he's not a governor anymore, now he's turning his attention to uh, reveal his secrets, as it were, how it is he won uh, the, the competition, how he won you know, this Mr. Olympia title for seven years, eight years, however many times he actually won it. And what he actually described in describing how it is he pursued that was with the same level of commitment that Paul is describing here. He said basically to win, to be the best in this competition, he had to set his eyes on the goal continually. It had to be before his eyes. And he had to strive towards that goal with all that he had to give to it. When he went into the gym and he lifted the weights, he had to work as hard as he possibly could. He always had to push himself to go further. He could not be content with where he had stayed last time or how much he achieved last time. He had to push even harder. He had to constantly change his program so that, if you know anything about how this works, his muscles wouldn't get used to the routine. And when it came to nutrition, which is the second part of this competition, you had, or he had, to push away all the junk food. Anything that would be a step in the wrong direction. And he had to eat only those things that would move him closer to his goal. Now Paul tells us to do that to, to excel in the Christian life, or as Spurgeon puts it, to be a better soul winner. We essentially have to do the same thing. We have to exercise self-control, self-discipline. We have to get the things that are in our way out of the way, the things that move us in the wrong direction, and do only those things that move us towards that goal. In other words, you have to stop doing the things that weaken your ability to serve the Lord. And that happens when you flirt with your enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, you've heard on numerous occasions, you've read it in Scripture, sin quenches the work of the Holy Spirit in your soul. Sin weakens you. Compromise weakens you. It's like eating those things that are bad for you that are going to take you in the wrong direction. They weaken you and make it more difficult to compete. It's like whist, you know, missing workouts or not putting any effort into them, going through them half-heartedly. Now, we do have to ask ourselves the question, we know that we make choices like this. We know we do things that basically are going to weaken us and compromise our ability to serve the Lord. But why do we do that? Why would we allow anything contrary to the goal that the Lord puts in front of us, what he calls us to? Well, we do that because usually we think that the compromise we're making is going to bring us some kind of fun. It's going to be pleasurable in some way. We wouldn't do it if we thought it was going to be, you know, self-sacrificed, if we thought it was going to be difficult. As a matter of fact, doing what's necessary to compete in the athletic competition or to live the Christian life. Those are the things that are difficult. Pleasure is easy. But you see, pleasure is exactly what Satan baits his hook with when he's fishing for you and for me. And he often catches us on that hook, doesn't he? Because he knows exactly how to bait the hook for each one of us. He knows exactly what pleasure it is that's going to trap us and ensnare us. This is the reason why Susanna Wesley said this to her children. She had a very helpful piece of advice. I've said it before. This is a little fuller quote that was meant to help them to avoid the thing that was going to get in their way more than anything else, and she knew exactly what it was. It was going to be pleasure. How can you tell whether or not that's something you should do or not do, whether it's sin or even if it's not sin, as the author to the Hebrews says, it doesn't have to be Sin, even things that aren't sinful, can entangle you. 
Exactly as Bunyan pointed out in Pilgrim's Progress and Vanity Fair, he said there are things lawful and unlawful that can ensnare pilgrims and keep them from moving forward. Well, this is what Susanna Wesley said to her children. She said, use this rule. Whatever weakens your reason impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense and sight of God, takes from you your thirst and relish for spiritual things, or increases the authority of your body over your mind, then that thing to you is sin, however innocent it may seem in itself. By this test you may detect evil, no matter how subtly or how plausibly temptation may be presented to you. So how do you know what to do and what not to do? Well, this is how you can tell. Now, sadly, most of the things in this world are going to have this kind of effect on our souls. But if you want to excel at serving Christ and at winning souls, you have to be able to set these things aside, even the things that may not necessarily be sinful, if they're slowing you down, if they're weighting you down, if they're getting in your way, if they're entangling you, if they are weakening you. You need to do instead the things that are going to strengthen you in the other ways. Strengthen your ability to compete. As the athlete, train hard. Watch what you eat. Make sure that everything you're doing is a step towards the goal. Instead of engaging in those things that weaken you, do the things that will make you stronger, that will strengthen your ability to think, that will make your conscience tender that will give you a clearer sight and sense of God, that will strengthen your relish and delight in spiritual things, that will give your mind control over your body. That reminds me of uh, what Jonathan Edwards had to say. He said, most of the people in this world live like animals. They, they live as though they don't have reason. They let their bodily impulses make their decisions for them. Isn't that what you know is meant by the commercial and grab for all the gusts that you can and do what's fun and living for the weekend? I mean, people live for pleasure. In other words, I have this desire because I have this desire. It's good, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. Jonathan Edwards said when you live like that, you live like the animals because, you know, they do whatever they desire to as well. They don't have a, a rational mind, but we do. It's part of the image of God. And we're supposed to use that mind to decide what is good and what is evil and to do what is good. So we need to do those things that will give our minds control over our bodies and not the other way around. So how do you do that? Well, that's what the means of grace are for. That's what God's word is for and why we should read it. That's, that's why all these books have been written that are in the library, at least a good number of them, is to help you to do these things that actually Susanna Wesley was encouraging her sons to do so that you wouldn't fall into that snare. Reading God's Word, studying His Word, praying and asking for God's help, fellowshipping with God's people, praying together with them, worshiping together with them, spending time with those who are like-minded who have that same desire and same goal so that the faith they have and the fire they have will enkindle the same thing within you those basically who want the same things. Now again, all these things that I've just mentioned, the means of grace, these are not ends in and of themselves, but these are means to an end. The end is that you might serve the Lord with greater zeal and strength, but you have to use them before they're going to be any help in that area. So you do have to know there is a prize and you have to desire that prize. You have to discipline yourself in order to be, as it were, equipped to pursue that prize. And then finally, Paul says, you have to put your full effort into winning that prize. He says in verse 24, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Now, the only way you can do that is by putting your full effort into it. So once you have fed yourself with the means of grace, the, the right spiritual nutrients, and you've trained properly, you need to run. 
You see, the work isn't done once you've used the means. You've just equipped yourself to be able to do what it is those means are to equip you to do. The end is that you might be filled with God's Spirit, that you might be equipped to serve Him, and that you might actually serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul. If you've only been brought to the place where you know what it is that God wants you to do, and you want to do what he wants to do because you've been using the means of grace, but you never actually do it, what the Lord calls you to do, then you're like an athlete who has conditioned himself to compete in, in whatever the event may be, but who actually never does compete because he never actually runs. It's not enough to be prepared. Those are, again, means to the end. The end is that we would actually run. You need to run. You need to do what God calls you to do if you were to win the prize. I mean, as we read these passages by Paul, as I pointed out, he believed he had to run this race. He believed that this was something he had to do. If he was to obtain the resurrection from the dead, if he wasn't going to be disqualified, if, if he was going to become a, a fellow partaker of the gospel, he knew it wasn't enough to desire it. He actually had to do it and that's what you and I need to do we need to do what God calls us to do to win this prize and we need to do it with the kind of zeal that, that he tells us here is necessary to win that prize with all our heart and mind and soul and strength win or run in such a way that you may win anything less Paul is telling us won't do so again, let's be encouraged this evening because this, I think, is perhaps an element we would all admit that we lack. I mean, yes, there, there are certain things that we're doing, but the question is, are we doing it with this kind of effort? Are we doing it with this kind of zeal? This is certainly the way that Jesus lived. This is certainly the way the Apostle Paul lived. This is the way I believe that Spurgeon lived. He often broke his health because of all he was doing and had to take his rest and then come back and, and start up again. Uh, as you know, George Whitfield virtually preached with his dying breath. Actually, he was praying with his dying breath, but he preached to the point where he was just about dead, and then when he went to his home to take his rest, there was a group of people who followed him, and they wanted him to preach again. So he preached to them again, and he wrenched out everything that was left in his body, and after he preached and they left, he got on his knees to pray, and he died. He gave everything he had to serve the Lord. Now, we do need to be careful. God doesn't want us to necessarily break our health in serving him. But there may be more that we can do than, than we are doing. And if so, we need to pursue that because Jesus is worth it, because the kingdom of heaven is worth it, because the prize is worth it. And let me just say, I'm encouraging or trying to encourage myself just as much as I'm trying to encourage you because we all need this kind of encouragement. I think I told you before that years ago I, I was under two different pastors when I was attending church. One of them talked about the grace of God every Sunday. Grace, grace, grace. And I just felt myself getting fat with grace and sort of sinking down into the, into the pews, as it were, into the chairs and feeling like, ah, oh, Jesus has done it all and I really don't need to do anything. And, and all that grace just made me actually feel like I didn't really need to do anything. And then the other minister would, when he came back into the pulpit after you know, a couple of years, he, he started kicking us as it were behind and, and said, you know what, you need to get up and you need to serve Christ. You need to get out there and you need to evangelize. And it was really under that kind of preaching that I began to do things like that. Now we do need both, of course. But we can't just bathe ourselves in grace and the means of grace and the love of God and, and never really begin to do what all those things are meant to move us to do, which is to do what the Lord calls us to do. The Lord has a purpose in saving us, and we've just seen what that is. He sets before us a prize. It's a great prize. It's a wonderful reward. It's, it's so great we can't even imagine what it's like. But in order to attain it, having come to Jesus Christ, having trusted him, having turned from our sins, we do need to discipline ourselves like athletes training for a competition. And then... We need, as the Lord gives us the ability to do that work to the very best of our ability, to run in such a way 
that we may win. This is the way Paul tells us that he would become a fellow partaker of the gospel. This is the way that he would attain to the resurrection of the dead. This is the way that he, after he had preached to others, would not be disqualified. We need to be pressing forward. Jesus said when John the Baptist was preaching, he says the kingdom of heaven was like a, a kingdom that was being overrun, broken into by violent men seeking to get in. And he said that is the kind of violence that we should be putting out to press into the kingdom of heaven. It's a life of effort. And we need, by God's grace, to put as much into it as we possibly can. This is the effort that God says that he's going to reward. So may he encourage all of us to, to do the very best we can by his grace and to have a, a clear sight of what it is he calls us to do and seek to do this. Again, we're not doing this to, be, to save ourselves. We can only do this if we're saved. But if we are saved, this is what we'll be seeking after. This is what we'll be trying to do because we know this is the only thing that's going to give glory to the Lord and the only thing that's really going to bring the sheep into the kingdom of heaven. So may the Lord give us grace uh, to do this. Let, let's uh, bow in a word of prayer and, and let's ask the Lord to help us do this.